I'm not saying go out there and be a stripper. I mean, if you want to, by all means do it. But like moving out of your comfort zone, moving out of that area where you think that you can't go, that can be very empowering. And that can lead you to, you know, that can lead you to places that you never expected. It can expand your idea of the possibilities of um, what you can accomplish in life. I mean, that certainly Mm. is what stripping did for me, you know. Hello, my name is Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories they created there, and the people that they used to know. This week, we are catching up with Craig Seymour, an American writer, music critic, and former stripper. And we are heading back to the 1990s to find out about his time stripping at various clubs throughout Washington, D.C. At that point in time, there was a strange quirk in the zoning laws that meant that strippers could be fully naked and fondled by customers. Whilst a graduate at the University of Maryland, Craig started to write an ethnographic study of the clubs. And what better way to learn about your subject than immersing yourself? We talk all about a number of clubs, which include La Caja Fall, Secrets, and Wet, and all of the experiences that led to Craig writing his memoir, All I Could Bear, My Life in the Strip Clubs of Gay Washington, D.C. Oh, and before we start the episode, I need to let you know that I finally got my shit together and set up some socials for this podcast. I would love if you could come and talk to me on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. My user handle for all of them is Lost Spaces Pod. Right, shall we get started? I feel like in my generation, sex was like a whole part of the weekend experience. Do you know what I mean? So it was like, you went out, you saw your friends, you drank, you then maybe met somebody and, you know, something might have gone on. You might have gone home with the person, then maybe you went back to the club or something. Oh, or, I mean... you Oh, you were a partier then. Um, <laughs> just that whole, like... Well, you might need to, suppose you didn't have a ride. But like if, but anyway, you, um, oh no, it's like, I just have a sex coma. Like I'm just gone, it's, you know, as soon as you've come. <laughs> there just doesn't seem to be that aspect of going to a physical location to be around other gay people. And that sex is sort of a part of that, but not the whole part of that. Because now that you can just order up sex on your phone it's not a part of anything. It's just when you get horny, you just, you know. It's more transactional. Turn on one of the apps or something and you, yeah. And, and it's just, and that it's not mixed into anything. And I think. Um, but so you're not, you're not saying that like, you're not saying that younger people, young people nowadays, you're not saying that they are having less sex. You're just saying that it's t- t- accessed in a different way. They're probably having more because it's because you don't have to wait till the weekend for it to go out or something to when, you know, the hot guys are going to be out or whatever. You know, I think you basically can get it whenever you want it. I also think that they're less. Um, now, how can I put this in a way that does not sound awful? <laughs> just say it. <laughs> just say this it. Is also, this, this, be nasty. this is not even younger people. This is but like. I mean, I think there was a whole fantasy aspect of um, meeting somebody at a nightclub, something that had to do with like the low lighting and then they were wearing their best clothes. You were wearing your best clothes. Everybody was kind of like bathed in cheap cologne. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) And so there was this whole sort of fantasy thing to it. Now, once you got to the person's house and under the track lighting and whatever and everything like that, the fantasy was shattered, you know, in the morning and everything like that. But there was at least sort of that fantasy element involved in initially hooking up where now you go on an app and you just see people's like, um, 
you know, it, the picture could be like their high school graduation. It could be like, it could be. Who are you talking their, to? Their, they used on LinkedIn. I mean, it, <laughs> well, I'm just saying, I mean, I'm just so people's, all sorts of people's profile. I actually don't even have it, to be honest with you. But um, I'm just talking about like, even on like Tinder or just whatever, people's profile pictures can be just widely varied in what they represent. And they seldom represent what people used to try to represent when they went out Mm -hmm. to a nightclub. So I think a lot of that whole, like, I think people are much, there's sort of more of a realism to sex now in a way where people just are um, just hooking up with who people, you know, basically are. And they don't need that whole fantasy of the low lighting and the cheap cologne and the few bits of interesting conversation that that person might have see um, i kind of view it in a different way and like the i think mm-hmm. people now because there is so much choice people don't make a decision like in the you know in the olden mm-hmm. days before you had that option of oh i can just go home and log on to grinder and find someone there you'd be like right there are 20 people left in this club and i'm gonna have to go home with someone so i'm <laughs> yeah. gonna have to do the round and closing yeah. time is soon and, yeah and so you would just like you would you know yes you might settle but like you would make a decision and you would go for it and now it's like people can just stay at home and be on grinder all night and be like Nah, no one's really ticking all my boxes. I do hear that from friends that um, I've actually never hooked up on an app. <gasps> but um, I do hear that there's frustration from my friends said there's this frustration where they could be like talking to a guy, um, you know, texting back and forth for hours and hours and hours. And then at the end of it, it's just kind of like, oh, well, now it's late. So uh, it was good talking to you. Good night. You know, so that there's all this lead up, but it never actually leads to sex. Whereas Mm. you're right. Like at a nightclub, closing time's coming. There are only about few people left. People tended to pair off. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I have, if I don't do something now, I have to wait a whole week till next Saturday. So I better. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Um, So do you remember then? So, okay. So actually the question I want to ask is, when you started going out on the scene, was it like a conscious thing? Like, I want to go to those strip clubs. I want to go to those sex clubs. Or was it just like, I'm going to try everything. Yes. I'm going to go everywhere. Yes. <laughs> no, and no, it was the two driving forces in my life. Um, I would say sex, but more in the sense of like, just liking being in that environment of being like the strip the club environment of just being it. around yeah. like, a lot of naked people. Yes. So that's definitely a driver. And then music. So it's like really underground house music. That's my thing. And naked guys are my thing. Unfortunately, there has never been a club that has paired the two (laughs) in any way. (laughs) Yeah. In any way that has been satisfying. So I was always, I'm always, always be bouncing around or going to different clubs for different things. So the options are um, men in clothes, good music, or men naked, bad music. Basically, (laughs) yeah, I think think you've really hit it. Very rarely does, um, I think because, you know, a lot of the strip club audience too is like older and it's a mix of like older and younger, but yet the, you know, the guys need something to dance to. So it's just always the most generic kind of like, top 40 crap that just nobody you know it's like inoffensive but it's just sort of like yeah yeah just like it's not hitting anyone's buttons but it's not pissing anyone off as well right exactly so then do you remember the first time you went to a strip club yes um (laughs) that was to see because this was also the time you know another thing that's been lost in um sort of gay culture is the gay press and DC had a really active gay press. Um, one of the papers was the Washington blade. And in the very back of the Washington blade, they always had advertisements for the strip clubs. And it would always tell you which porn star was coming to town to perform at one of the strip clubs. Cause this was at the time when porn stars were like movie mm-hmm. stars, you know, it was like, um, so when my favorite porn star who at the time was Joe, Joey Stefano, was performing at the Follies, 
I went to go see him, and that set off a whole lifetime of strip club love. Okay, so I'm just, I am totally naive, and it's not because I'm a prude. I just don't think that like strip clubs are a thing here like they are in America. Um, so what happens when you go and see a strip show from a celebrity? Well, different things. See, and that's why... Um, depending upon the clubs that you have gone to and depending upon the era in which you went, you could have, um, uh, you know, wildly different experiences or perceptions of what went on. So in the late eighties, early nineties, you could basically, they would get completely naked and you basically could touch the dancer wherever you wanted to. So like, you know, my hands been all on Joey Spano's butt, you know, probably cupped his balls a few times um, <laughs> or just whatever or you would tip and you would, you know, be able to touch the dancer. So, I mean, um, my follow-up question was going to be like, were you nervous on your first time there? But it sounds like that's not going to be the case. <laughs> you know, yes. I think the natural inclination would have been nervous, but it was that sort of thing where, like you were saying how at the close of the night, you know, you have to start making a decision. It's like, when if you've been like jacking off to Joey Stefano for years and he's finally like on a bar in front of you and there are a lot of other people like clamoring toward him and you know you actually have the chance to put your hands on him, you're going to get over your nervousness, push people out of the way and put your hands on Joey Stefano. <laughs> so, you know, I get over, got over the nervousness. I'm, so I'm, uh, I'm picturing those videos you see of people in Black Friday sales when the roller door comes up and everyone like runs through the front door and is like yeah. scramming and pushing each other out of the way for things. Is that what it was like? For for <laughs> certain superstars, it was deadly. It was definitely had a Black Friday <laughs> element to it that particular night. Not always, because sometimes it's the kind of thing you know. Not all porn stars are created equal, you know. So it was not necessarily a crush for everyone but certain ones um definitely there was that sense of like um in fact i even think somebody might have said to me that night like if you're not gonna touch get out of the way or something <laughs> you know like if I, if I was being like the least bit tentative you know like should i touch his balls or you know i was like so um yeah it, it was really much kind of um a sort of frenzy <laughs> that's a good w w were there security guards or is that a really naive question no, no, not security guards in the club um, because the area, um, the area where most of the strip clubs were was kind of a little isolated and there were break-ins occasionally, muggings and stuff like that. So there were, had been times when the clubs would get together and kind of have like a security guard just kind of like patrol the area, but never inside the clubs. There was never any reason. So no one was protecting Joey. Oh, no, no, no. Nor did he seem to want protection because, you know, with every touch, you get a bunch of bills. And, you know, that's the whole point is to make money. Well, yeah, but like, I mean, you know, you could get scratched and dry skin and... Probably did, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so then, so, yeah, so, so talk me through that first night then. Did you go on your own? Uh, no, I went with um, my best friend uh, who ended up being in a relationship with for like seven and a half years. And he's just, he's like completely anti, not anti, but he's just completely opposite. Strip clubs have never had any fascination for him. And um, before he's in a relationship now, but before he was in a relationship, he was definitely like an app person. Um, so we're very, very different like that. But um, he doesn't get why you would just want to sit around and look at like naked strangers all night and not necessarily be going home with them mm -hmm. or anything. And for me, that's just like thrilling, you know, because um, again, I just think that so much a part of my youth involved not looking at guys. So just that freedom is just kind of um, so much a part of me. And, you know, it's just that kind of thing, like what's in therapy, you just kind of keep reliving the same old things or keep reliving the same traumas or working it through. I just think that that's one of those things that's just so, um, uh, and, you know, it's interesting because a lot of strip clubs, like older, there are a lot of older people and I've always could relate to a lot of experiences for some reason of the guys who maybe came of age, like during the forties mm -hmm. or something like that, when you really couldn't look at somebody, you know, and you really had that kind of thing. And, we, for some reason, had the same experience of how um, 
freeing and just how wonderful it was just to be able to like look at naked guys Mm. you know and so do you get do you have that (laughs) feeling when you're like watching porn or is there something about being in that space and sharing that experience with other people Uh, i definitely prefer being in the space but i'm a porn person too um because again before i came out and before i um could ever go to a club i would watch porn you know um i would have to go to those sad little um video cassette stores and like go behind a little curtain and then go past all the street (laughs) racks of vhs's Oh, so you wouldn't do the thing where you you pretend you're interested in the straight stuff and then, like, after you're warmed up, then you make the beeline? No, I would I would probably do the thing more like, because usually all of the X-rated stuff was behind a curtain, so I would probably do the thing more of like, oh, let me browse the new releases <laughs> for five minutes and then zip behind the curtain. Oh my, oh Once my, I'm behind oh, the curtain, oh, it's just yeah. a bunch of pervs oh, like me. <laughs> and the other thing is, too, you know, this was a part of just being there being kind of like a gay neighborhood, like where I would rent the, the tapes would be in a video <gasps> in video store in the gay neighborhood. So most of the people in the porn part were gay. And that was like a, you know, the majority of the material. It wasn't like I was in some suburb where they're like have um, three bisexual tapes mm-hmm. and the rest is you know, straight or anything. But so you would like rent that. the porn. Sorry, this is, sorry, this is like, I, sh- I shouldn't mm-hmm. be like... <laughs> Rent the tape like a blockbuster. Oh, wow. Yeah, get a day or maybe a day and a half, and then watch it and return it. Or you would copy it to <laughs> video see players and you were there. a pirate. So, you know? uh, but then were they mm. were there particular scenes where the film was quite worn? Uh, not generally, but you know, video cassettes, video technologies, as people know through apps, you know, they are what they are. So you know. You might get a little streak going through there now or something. But, um, and I can honestly say I have never once watched a porn film all the way through. You know, I'm totally like, <laughs> just fast forward, stop, pause, rewind 15 seconds, go back. You know, I'm very much just like a, you know. Yeah, well, who, I mean. Just go right for the, I'm not there for the plot or anything. But there are a lot of people that really are. No, there are. No, really? There are a lot what? of people, yeah. Because, um, you know, when I lived in Chicago... Because they want to feel emotionally invested. Well, I don't know what it was, but the, in Chicago, the Grabbies, which is like the Gay Porn Awards, mm-hmm. is a big thing. And I would go every year and all these porn stars would come to town and all the fans would come to town too. And there were really like a whole group of fans who would have conversations with the porn models about, oh, you know, and when in this plot, when you did this and that and what... And they would really be into it. So there's definitely a... Um, and and it was non-ironic. No, no, <laughs> completely earnest. And a lot of the poor models would really get sort of, um, you know, like choked up if they were to win Best Actor or something in like, you know, Cox R Us or you know, whatever it was. They would really be, you know, they would get up and give the acceptance speech and thank their oh, wow. agents and everything. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh, because see, I had thought, and maybe it's just, because of the porn I consume, but I thought that plot had just like everyone had just accepted that there's no, there's not going to be plot anymore. Not so much. And there's a certain, I mean, it's increasingly getting this way. I mean, probably I'm talking about the era of like maybe pre like 2013 or something Mm -hmm. like that. Um, When, you know, you were still talking about like directors like Shishi LaRue, who were very into like, how a shot was set up and all this kind of stuff. And certain porn um, companies were known for having better production values than other ones and all of this kind of stuff. You know, it was very, it was a whole thing because part of us, this is another thing that people don't get about strip clubs. Part of being a, going to strip club too, and being a strip club regular is developing friendships, whatever you want to call it, relationships with the various dancers. And so you kind of like, you know, talk to them all the time, get into their stories, their narratives and all this kind of stuff. So it's kind of like, it's just, it's almost being part of like an ongoing soap opera or something. So um, there's that emotional connection that's there that um, is appealing. And the thing is, you know, people always say, oh, they're just talking to these people for money. Oh, they're just doing this thing for money. And of course that's true. But then, there, but there's something just about the nature of, 
human interaction. I mean, if you have a group of people together for a period of time, you know, genuine relationships, genuine um, emotions do develop. And, you you know, there's some people that I still know from when I used to strip, when I was a customer and just stuff like that, just because, you know, for whatever reason you, um, and I think that part is. So does, but does talking to them not kind of shatter the illusion for you? No, it actually deepens. It, it, it sort of, it, maybe it's not so much about the illusion and the fantasy, because maybe it's about like, you're able to talk to a guy that you would not necessarily be able to talk to on Mm -hmm. the street or would even see in the clubs. A lot of the guys are are sort of straight identified. So you wouldn't really be having that kind of conversation with a straight identified guy that was completely naked in front of you, you know, or whatever. So, um, but yeah, so there was that kind of thing too. And just kind of meeting people um, that you just would not meet in just your regular gay Mm -hmm. clubs, just, you know, interesting. And then you would watch their journey. Like sometimes you, you, there are tons of times that I'd be at the strip club, you know, somebody's first time stripping and maybe they were considered themselves straight then, but you would see kind of their trajectory and sort of expanding (laughs) their blossoming like a flower. (laughs) Basically. But you know, this was before you could um, binge things on Netflix. So (laughs) like being part of watching a, you know, continuing serial, just seeing kind of how people, kind of develop over time um, it's sort of interesting so the the one thing i was going to ask so you said that um strip clubs were fully nude and that was odd it, like so i think i've only ever been to one strip club in my life and there was a, the, oh, the, the only memory i have the only memory i have is this guy with a cock ring on and his penis was like purple from from <laughs> the lack of blood uh, occupational going, going hazard to, yeah. <laughs> and just feeling like really um sorry <laughs> just like just a bit horrified about how purple it was but he was like so he was fully nude so i just kind of assumed that all strip clubs were fully nude are they not in america in america it's it's um regulated like per i don't even know if it's state but per um I, yeah i'm pretty sure it's by this by the state so there can be a lot of different bizarre things most places don't allow full nudity um most states you have to have on some kind of g-string or a jock strap or something like that now there are some states where you can be fully nude but you cannot drink so that's a whole other <laughs> subclass uh. of strip clubs but D.C. happened to be a um, weird little area where you could be fully nude and you could drink. But <laughs> this was the weird thing about D.C. Um, and these are all laws that came about after Prohibition. But the weird thing about D.C. is that every single bar had to have a fully functioning kitchen. So you could be <laughs> fully nude and you could drink at the location. And if needed, you could make a meal. <laughs> or somebody could make a meal for you. But, um, but and that was but, tended to be the dressing rooms of any strip club where it was like the kitchen in DC. So, so it needed to be fully functioning, but it didn't need to be used. Uh, I, well, you know, I don't know if that's the case. They, it, they definitely had inspections and almost every strip club that I know about at some point or another had like, a Sunday buffet, a uh, taco night. With a side of pubes, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't think you'd want, ideally, the customers or the strippers to have taco breath, but, you know, I'm not one to judge a kink. Uh, but, yeah, so I don't know if they had to have them functioning, but they often did function. And at one of the, um, this was like a, more like a, um, porn theater i worked at that had the um intermission entertainment we would come out and strip (laughs) but on sundays we would then have to put on some clothes run next door where the where the associated club was get uh, the food for the sunday buffet and then serve the customers the sunday buffet (laughs) which was always like really um meat and potatoes and things like that i mean really heavy you know sort of like mama's home cooking type food which was just so weird i never ate a thing in any strip club just for the record but but when you were not that i'm judging anybody that has i mean if you can get a free meal but 
Absolutely. But how many uh, like sausage and meat puns were you subjected to when you were handing out the food? You know, not it was not on. Um, nobody really treated it like with irony or that it was anything weird about it. It was really a very <laughs> earnest <laughs> endeavor. I mean, they just wanted the a wholesome Sunday lunch. <laughs> I never heard a meat pun. I never heard anything like that. I mean, it was very, very you know, above board and just very taken <laughs> seriously. <sighs> Letting me down, Americans. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so when did you start working in strip clubs? Um, I guess about um, two or three years after I started going to them. And it was just the kind of thing where I was kind of fascinated with the experience. And I was at the age where I could still, <laughs> do, you know, sort of reasonably do this um, stripper thing. So I just wanted to give it a try just to say that, you know, just to see what it was like. And I I, I loved it. I mean, it really brought out a side of me that I don't think I necessarily would have ever gotten in touch with had I not done it just in terms of being very, very comfortable, you know, not just being naked in public, but um, which I would not do now. But I mean, just talking to different people and just kind of, Doing, I don't, almost like being a performer, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And so that was a side of me I had never really explored like that. So that was great for a time period. And then it sort of ran its course. And, um, you know, I am went back to just being a customer. And I'm, I'm perfectly happy with like living the rest of my life in that mode. Uh, so then let's talk about that first time that you stripped. Do you remember the, the night what and what happened? I do, but it was not a night. It was during the day um, oh. because the first time that I did it, I think I was trying to um, sort of ease my way into tripping. So I was, it, I was, I stripped at that theater I was telling you about that had strippers in between the um, the movies. And so what happens is when you would be booked for that, you would be. Um, you would have shifts. The shifts were 12, 3, 6, 9, and 12. So, and I was, you know, got to know the person that booked the dancers and told him I wanted to try it out. So he booked me for a, a weekend or whatever. And so the first time I ever stripped was 12 o'clock in the day. <laughs> it was midday. And um, I was not nervous about the nudity in any way. It was, First of all, there were only probably like three people in the theater at like 12 noon on a Sunday or whatever. But it was more just like, it was more like the mechanics. Like I had never thought about just the very process of like taking off my clothes. You know, it's one of those things that. In a sexy way. Yeah. I I mean, I guess, you know how people like sometimes when they go through traumatic injuries, they have to learn how to do very basic things and they become very self-conscious of things that we just take for granted. It was like, okay, how do I lift up my, you know, like I just did not know. Like uh, all of a sudden I, you know, I'd been taking, um, putting my clothes on and off for my entire life. All of a sudden I did, couldn't, everything just became completely foreign and weird. So my response to that was just to like take everything off <laughs> right away and then just walk into the audience. Cause what we were supposed to do is like take one thing off and dance a little bit and then take another thing off. Here's, you know, I guess give a little bit of a strip yeah, tease and then you walk it, in yeah. the audience to talk to the <laughs> customers and get um, tips. But I just was like, you know, this is just feeling too strange. I don't even know how a zipper works. You know, like I'm just like, <laughs> taking everything off. And then I just ran into the audience and that was it. So that was my first uh, experience. Oh, so did you get to like choose the song or anything? Or was it just like the, this This film has ended, go to the front of the, the cinema and take your clothes off? Well, you could choose what song you wanted to dance to sort of it couldn't be like (laughs) death metal or something like that or it couldn't be like you know tupac or something i mean it had to be within a range of first of all it had to be this was in the cd days so it had to be within the range of the cds that the dj had or that you happened to bring with you and also it was kind of like an earned privilege so i'm not sure that i really had that option the first time i danced 
and I don't even remember what the song was, but I know what happened was there were three dancers. So um, I'd come out, then another dancer would come out, then another dancer would come out, and then we would all come out for a set. So I do remember that the first time I was dancing in the collective set, it was Madonna's Where's the Party. I'll never forget that. Oh. This mix that went on forever. <laughs> but yeah, but then as it, you know, it was kind of like, then as it went along, you could say like, oh, you know, play, I don't know, TLC Creep or whatever. You know? And then you could oh, dance that's that. that's a good sound. So that would too. be, um, yeah, I'm not sure I ever actually did. But um, yeah. No. And just but, I mean, you could do a back. whole thing with satin pajamas. You could have, you could have made that work. Definitely. That's a lot of work. That's the one <laughs> thing about the, like, you know, people also think like, cause they've seen magic Mike and things like that. I mean, nobody put any effort into, well, there were some people, but they were considered kind of strange, but nobody put any effort into like the more basic you could look and the more you could just look like you were like a college jock or just, you know, whatever, just, or a preppy college student or just whatever you could just, however, just look like a normal guy you know normal this guy that somebody oh, might oh, see somewhere just need to be clear we're using air quotes for normal right? yeah 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 i did do air quotes. <laughs> I, I did definitely have the air quotes um i think i was using air quotes for both of those things but just like your average basic whatever type of person it wasn't about kind of having like some huge fantasy i mean there was some people with like magician capes and like also <laughs> like wands and maybe they'd have little like I don't know, little bits, but that was not really what people wanted. They really just wanted to think that they were relating to just just your average, um, again, in air quotes, you know, dude on the streets and just whatever. So was there kind of a weird homophobia type thing where everyone was like pretending to be straight? Um, no, it wasn't homophobia so much as I would say it was um, a... I would say it was definitely within the, it definitely operated within the sort of parameters, very traditional gender ideas. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I don't think it, it was, it wasn't really rooted in, it wasn't like that mask for mask culture or anything like that. You know, it wasn't really rooted in that, but there was definitely like, and, and again, we were talking about the, we we're talking about like the late eighties and the nineties. So it was just a completely different time. But um, definitely, I think the more you conform to whatever was considered like the masculine gender norm of the time, probably the more successful you were in the club. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, that kind of that changed over time, just as I think um, our sort of culture, just in general, especially queer culture, um, has become kind of sort of more broad about sort of like... Um, non-traditional gender expressions, non-binary gender expressions and things like that. I, I think there was an aspect of that that kind of came into the club toward the end. But and that was like a lot of the younger dancers kind of brought that element in in sort of like a punk. We're going to do this kind of way. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're not going to make us be conform to your, you know, idea. we're not going to pretend to be like, yeah, we're just going to be who we are. Um, but definitely in the time that I was working in, it was the kind of like jock stereotype or the preppy stereotype or just all of the bad boy stereotype you know and did you find that like conf conflicting i didn't particularly because that was just the culture that was like the way that the culture was kind of constructed around the times i mean i definitely saw them as um limiting stereotypes certainly but that was the you know the kind of archetypes that you got in the club was the same things you were seeing in the porn, which the same things you were seeing in the porn magazines, which were the same things that you were seeing in the, you know, fashion spreads of the gay magazines. It was just, it was just that era of gay. Just the accepted norm for the, yeah. You know, just like the clone culture of the seventies and just things like that. It was just, um, t there was definitely a um, moment where people definitely tried to be tight. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. that's just what it was. Mm. So I'm I'm a little sad that you didn't like uh, get to pick your own songs. If if you were to do it now, <laughs> well, I did. What I mean, like I said, you... I oh okay. Well, tell oh, me God. then. Tell me what songs you did. Oh, I don't remember. I, I don't oh. remember. But I'm just saying, like at a certain point, you could like. What would happen is like before 
the set, you would go into the DJ booth and like you, I would just kind of flip through the DJ CDs and I'd go, oh, play the, that, that kind of thing. But it wasn't like my own CD collection. So it was never anything that I was like, like, this is my jam. So you did you so, know, that crazy about, but you know, so yeah, exactly. So you don't have like a, a, a memorable favorite song that you love to perform to? No. Um, oh. If anything, <laughs> I kind of remember things that are just sort of like, that were just played a lot. I'm not saying that this, I'm not really like hating on this, but like for, for some reason, you know, I remember dancing to, and I love Frankie Knuckles. Like Frankie Knuckles is like my favorite, one of my favorite DJs. You know, I saw him many, many times. I love like Frankie Knuckles remixes, but for some reason I danced to Frankie Knuckles remix of Tony Braxton's Unbreak My Heart, like a lot. <laughs> Very vivid memories. <laughs> Cause it had like that moment when it was like, you know a new song and then it had a moment when it was like a blockbuster hit and then it had that moment when it was just kind of like a classic and it was just sort of like you know they were like it was just felt like years of um of that so that that, like i mean <laughs> that, it's, a very, it's a very odd song to strip to isn't it <laughs> uh I really don't know that, like, it was the kind of thing where you were thinking about the... the oh, okay, so lyrics. you weren't lip syncing I mean, then. I mean, more... <laughs> no, 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 no. And, it, and, you know, sometimes you really could kind of tune out the music and it was kind of like, oh, wait a minute, I'm completely off beat. Oh, wait a minute. Because you weren't even dancing so much. You were kind of... See, it depended upon... So for another club that was secret, that was called Secrets, it was sort of like a rotation of where you would dance. So there was a bar... And then there was like a box and then there was a stage and then there was another box and then there was a, and then there was a box during the door. So there was like, a, so you would make a rotation. So like when you were on the bar, you weren't dancing very much because you didn't want to kick off. You wouldn't kick over somebody's drink, um, which I did many times, unfortunately, <laughs> but you didn't want to kick over anybody's drink. And there wasn't that much space. You certainly didn't want to fall on your ass. So you weren't really dancing then. And then after that, you'd be on the box. And so there wasn't really much space to dance. And if you were any good and you were popular, you had a bunch of people around you. So you're more like talking to people and things like that. On the stage, there was more space to dance. But again, you're kind of like walking around. To, the job was to walk around to the people and try to get the money. The job wasn't really like to, you know, like a, like a drag performance. Um, drag performers can go out and they can kind of like do half the song and then a bunch of people might run up and like throw them a bunch of dollars or something. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, they'll be showered with dollars. That does not happen with strippers. Strippers, you need to make that money right then and there. People might decide to like not tip. So it's like, uh-huh. is somebody standing there with a dollar? You go and cut that dollar and whatever, you know, um, the beat of the song, be damned, you know, <laughs> you just like rush over whatever and just get it, talk to the person and then move on to the, to the next person. It wasn't uh-huh. um, a, performance at all and you would try to maximize and you would try to minimize the amount of time that you would just be dancing without getting any money you know like yeah. you, if there was somebody if you got on stage and there was somebody standing there you jump on stage and walk right over to the person that was there you wouldn't like i don't know do dilly a little dally. eight count and before you go over <laughs> oh see and i i think you know i learned all i know about stripping from showgirls so i think i'm coming at this from like, the complete <laughs> wrong perspective i'm like yeah and then i'd have well, this wrong, outfit on and then i'd be <laughs> you can tell me i'm wrong it's fine don't be nice i had like five g-strings you know just like like um maybe three pairs of cutout shorts like so you didn't spend your whole week choreographing numbers <laughs> No, 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 not at all. The biggest issue, the biggest issue really was just keeping track of socks because socks would get very, very dirty and you, and it was kind of gross to dance in dirty socks. But even more than that, um, because, you know, we were completely naked so that the, the customers would put the dollars in our socks, not in our G strings or anything like that. So the elasticity of the sock <laughs> would sort of wear down quickly. start to go bad <laughs> over time. <laughs> so you would want to make sure. So like at home, you know, when I was packing to go, I would always have to try to make sure that I had a sock that had a good hold. So I wouldn't want to be like littering dollars. <laughs> you know, that's my money. Yeah, yeah. So I would want to make sure that I had, you know, so that was, you know, just something to keep track of. Sometimes I didn't even take them home, honestly. Like if, if they were just like wet and like just 
filthy with you know i would just throw them in the um kitchen trash can because like i said there was a fully functioning kitchen <laughs> which is where we <laughs> And so, like, so there's a stigma, there's still a stigma around stripping uh, and around performing in that way. Were you open with the people in your life that you were doing it? Well, my boyfriend that I live with, yes, because that would be kind of hard to have pulled. <laughs> Why are all your socks so skanky? Where are you going every night? <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> but, uh, no, I didn't get, you know, it's kind of thing like, um, I have always felt that as a queer person, you know, Mm -hmm. who had to kind of grow up and make my own, you know, I have very supportive parents, very supportive family and everything like that. But at the same time, my development as a gay man is something I did. Do you know what I mean? It's something I, it's an identity I forged with my looking for my own resources and everything like that. So it's sort of my thing. So I don't necessarily, I don't, I don't have never lied about anything that I've done and everything, but I don't necessarily feel like I owe it to everyone to know every aspect of my gay life because, because I feel like there are a lot of aspects of gay culture that if you're not a part of gay culture, you don't necessarily understand. And I'm not really like, I don't feel like having to explain all of that to people, although that's what I've been doing, I guess, for the last hour. But <laughs> you know, I have to like contextualize every aspect of what I do and why I do it and why I'm the why I am the way I am because I grew up in, you know, a um heterosexist culture and everything like that. So no, I didn't tell it but you know, what so what happened is my parents found out they knew I was writing a book. And I, you know, would like slowly drop like, oh, it's a memoir. And then I slowly drop it. Oh, it's like, you know, has a lot to do with my life as a gay guy. And then it's sort of been like, you know how I would all, how I like go and strip clubs a lot, you know? So it was just kind of like piecing it out there. Not really the, because I was like scared of the reaction or anything, but just kind of like to just sort of baby steps and more. And, and so the deal that I had with my parents, because I wanted to at least like, read the book because other people I didn't want people to like come at them with unexpected questions not knowing so when the book was in galley form which is like the advanced release that send to reviewers I let them read it and I basically just told them that I would answer any question that they had about it but they had to read the entire thing first Uh and understand my journey and understand the trajectory that I went through and then I would answer any questions but I wanted them to at least understand what the journey was my mother completely respected my wishes and did that. My father had like a question, like by page three or something was like, email me, but you know, he completely did not um, sort of respect my wishes, but. Oh, but they both like, they both were like, yeah, I'm going to read it. They weren't like, actually, I don't want to know about this. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. oh yeah. They both definitely read it. And, you know. oh. and I don't, I'm not the type of person that, you know, I don't, bring it up all the time like i feel no need to like necessarily discuss it you know it's there it's a book you know if if people want to read it it's fine i used to teach there are tons of my students that never knew i was stripping that never knew they knew i wrote books they didn't necessarily know what it was about um yeah i just feel like all of the information about me is very very out there you know on the internet on Amazon, on whatever, you can find out more than you would ever want to know about me if you want to. So I don't feel the need to be the mouthpiece for that. You know, I don't feel the need to be my own publicist. If you're that interested, you can just go online and find out and whatever. So um, all that to say to answer your question, you know, I don't really keep any secrets, but I don't necessarily feel the need to explain my life or tell people well i guess i did feel the need to explain my life but and since i did in the form of a memoir i don't feel like the need to have got it out of your system yeah yeah exactly exactly um so when um when did you decide to quit um i decided to quit when i was working as um well that's not really true when did i decide i kept I kept sort of thinking it was going to be my last time and I sort of ended it in the same way that I began. So what happened was I stopped working the clubs. Like I stopped being on the bars um, first 
because that just got to be too much like shift work and just too much of a grind. And I didn't have my own weekends or anything like that. And so I kind of went back to just working at the theater. So that was just like one day, but it was just a full day. And I could tell my regulars where I was and they show up and everything. And I could just kind of get it out of the way. And I still had other, you know, weekend days and everything. Because once you're on a shift, like at a regular club, they really expect you, you have to work every weekend. You usually have to work Thursday through Sunday. And then I think that, um, you know, one day I just, it, it probably was a day, honestly, when I had to serve that damn Sunday buffet and I just got tired of like, having to like, strip and like run, get this nasty, like, you know, meat and potatoes food and serve it up and stuff. And I just think I was like, you know, don't put me on the schedule for next month and I that just I, I just let it go ah. it's like I knew it was it, I knew I wasn't going to do it forever so I knew it had to stop it's that I was going to stop at some point so it just sort of like I just kind of let it phase out which so I was so I don't even know that um but I do know this I do know this the Follies which was the name of the theater they had like it was some anniversary. I don't know if it was like the 30th anniversary, the 20th anniversary, the 10th anniversary, some anniversary. And that was after I had stopped stripping. And they called a lot of the oh, older strippers back for that night. And I did come back for that night and strip. So I, I think that was the final night. So that was nice for it to be kind of like a, a little bit of a party and stuff. Yeah, the sad day was when they w- w- was the last day for the clubs, when the, um, the clubs had fought all of their battles against the city to try to remain open. And um, the zoning base, they had changed the zoning law. So basically that there was no place for the clubs to relocate. Um, oh, that's harsh. So, yeah, you know, the, so the, they, they, they would say, Oh, you could relocate here, but it can't be between this many feet of a school and this. So they were, literally like no physical locations that where they could locate um certainly none within that were like entertainment districts or anything like that so all of the clubs closed on the same weekend and i was there for that weekend and that weekend was definitely one that you know you s- saw people in tears and um it was definitely a, a sense of loss and i mean i just remember because at this point I was living in Providence, Rhode Island, and I actually took the um, train down for the last weekend. And it was just a matter of like, just trying to be present, just taking it all in and just, um, you know, it, just, I mean, I that's that was my focus, just really trying to just be present in the moment. And I did the same old, you know, I got a couple of lap dancers, I met some new dancers, I did, the, you know, the same old thing and just... Um, said goodbye like do you ever I, I don't know that there's ever a perfect way to say goodbye but it was just like you know when I got in my car drove away I knew I didn't drive away because I was drunk but I got, <laughs> sorry good good I don't want to give any false messages. <laughs> when I got my taxi this was the Uber and went away like it was just a sense of like you know just like if it, if it was a movie of just the neon lights of the clubs receding in the distance and Mm. that was the last time i ever saw the block like that and um the next time i was there there was a gigantic baseball stadium you know so just knocked everything down everything like not even it's there's no remnants of what was um so then so the final question that i have for you is what do you think DC has lost now that it's lost those clubs? Um, it has definitely lost a sense of um, cities were much more sexual in the seventies and eighties to the extent that like, if you went in certain neighborhoods of big cities, you knew where, sort of the quote unquote red light district were or where there were porn theaters and things like that. And there were advertisements for them and there were, you know, nude, nude, nude would be mm-hmm. in like, <laughs> you know, and um, neon lights and stuff like that. Again, the, the strip clubs were all um, 
in concentrated in a particular area of DC, all within walking distance of each other. And it, it was right within like, you could see the Capitol and everything. It was right near downtown. It wasn't really a sense of hiding it in any mm. sort of way. And it was just, it was just part of city life, you know, um, where I think now the whole idea of city life has become much more sanitized and the kind of like a CD is such a pejorative word, but um, just that aspect of the city that was like where like sex work would happen and just things like that. And that was just kind of an accepted part of city life. I think there've been increasing efforts just to, do away with that. And I think in many cases it has less to do with morals than just real estate, you know, as cities mm -hmm. become popular again and become re and become gentrified again, people just want the space, you know? So um, where the strip clubs used to be, there's now a big soccer state. I mean, a big um, baseball stadium. Okay. I get the sports confused. Uh, <laughs> big baseball stadium. And, um, but the point being, it's the big state, it's, it's big sports stuff there now <laughs> and sports related uh, businesses and there are these luxury condos and everything. It's just completely been abolished. And the weird thing about it is, um, you know, just with the history of colonialism and things like that, you know, sometimes when a complete culture is wiped out, we've had the sort of, you know, sometimes you can see little plaques like this used to be a marketplace for blah, 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 or, or something that um, references the history of the people that used to occupy mm. the space before it became such a commercialized place. But, you know, that won't happen. There, there's no plaque that said, you know, on this ground, people used to, you know, play with themselves for dollar bills or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, whatever. Like, that won't be, uh, that's missing. So, um, how do I say this? I mean, it, it lost a queer aspect. And I, by queer, I don't just mean gay. I mean, like, you know, the sexual part of the city, the sex workers, the people who liked going to, you know, um, strip clubs and things like that. Just because it was not just the strip clubs. It's just like, it's sort of like the sanitization of the city of anything that had to do with, um, with sex. And like sex has kind of gone, the, the sexual side of the city has gone underground or it's become digitized through the app. And it's just a different age. You know, it's just a loss in, in the sense of historical time. I mean, I'm not the type of person that thinks that things necessarily are meant to last forever. You know, um, whole civilizations fall, you know what I mean? So it's not like, so of course, you know, strip clubs are going to close probably, but it's sort of definitely is the end of the city as being a very, a kind of uniquely queer space amidst these institutions of federal power, which was just a really interesting dynamic. You know, mm. it's just really interesting that there were these permissive, openly queer, openly sexual places that were right amidst these buildings where people made decisions that infected, that infected, <laughs> that affected the, um, infected you know, the entire words. country. And yeah. then just that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just that whole dynamic was just kind of interesting. And that's, um, and so that's different. But, you know, I'm glad that we have like podcasts like yours and stuff like that. I mean, it is so important because this is the type of history that most people don't even think that's important to record. And, you know, I was reading something recently just talking about, um, kind of African-American history. And a lot of what I do is write about black music and stuff. And it's sort of like you live through a period and what you often find is that you have to document things that you never felt like you would have to document mm. that you just felt like that would be a part of history. That's just something that was or something that would endure. But you find yourself at a certain point being like, wait a minute, this entire thing is becoming lost. This thing has to be documented. Um, and you were never thinking about that during the time. You were just living your life, you know? Do you have any memories of clubbing in Washington, D.C.? Have you ever stripped for money? 
Do you have anything to say about this episode? Well, anyway, for any of those reasons or anything else, I would love to hear from you. So why don't you get in touch? I am on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and my username is Lost Spaces Pod. You can also find Craig on Instagram and Twitter with the user handle Craig's Pop Life. And since you're on the internet, why don't you go and buy one of Craig's books while you're at it? There's All I Could Bear, which is the memoir we discussed in this episode, but he's also written a biography about Luther Vandross called Life and Longing of Luther Vandross. I'll make sure to include some links in the show notes for this episode. Lost Spaces is not only a podcast, but a concept record as well. I have been writing songs about queer venues and the people who used to live their lives there, and will be releasing songs over the next year. You can hear the first single, which is called Well Groomed Boys, and is also playing underneath my talking right now, on all streaming platforms. If you liked this episode, I would really appreciate if you subscribed, left a review on Apple Podcasts, or just told people who you think might be interested in giving it a little listen to. I am Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces.